Now to show you sometimes, even when things don't exactly work like the way you want them to, the Lord will help you if you stay in it. So this morning I have the honor of introducing to you Mr. Lance first. Uh, Lance is one of our missionaries. He and his family have been serving the Lord in the country of Ecuador for several years. And uh, my understanding is that Lance and his family are in the process of moving to Africa. And I'll let him explain all of that to you. But they are in the process of doing that. Lance's mission is one that this church supports. Uh, you go back into the hallway and walk down, you will see Lance and his family's picture on the wall. Uh, you will also see, I forgot to have Jim tell you in the announcements, there's a bulletin board in the hallway with pictures from the roping. And there's some really good ones, especially the ones with all the ladies sitting behind the, the concession stand going. Sorry, so, so Lance, you want to come on over here, bud? Lance is a local guy. If you don't know Lance, Lance is from Pleasanton. I went to school in fact with my wife and her family. So some of you may know him already. Everybody, let's give Lance first a round of applause. Thanks, sir. Good, well, good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. As Chris mentioned, uh, my name is Lance Ferguson, and uh, my family and I are, are missionaries that uh, Cowboy, uh, the Cowboy Church here in Wilson County partners with uh, to make disciples of people from, from all nations, uh, people from other cultures that they would know and love and walk with uh, Jesus. So if, if y'all could pull up the picture there of, of my family... Uh, as Chris mentioned, I, I grew up in Atascosa County. I hope y'all won't hold that, hold that against me. We did too. What's that? We did too. Oh, many of you did too. So uh, I came to faith in Christ as a college student at uh, Texas Tech University, as a freshman in college. Um, I was raised in church, would have told people I was a Christian growing up, uh, but I didn't believe the gospel. And I uh, found that out. My freshman year of college, I went to a college ministry service, and a college pastor shared the gospel really clearly, and I remember uh, just very clearly saying, I did not believe that message before. I have not believed that message, and I believe it now, and um, the Lord saved me. I trusted in Him, trusted in what He did uh, through His death and resurrection to save me, and uh, the Lord helped me grow in Him from that time. One of the, one of the things that, that um, uh, He did was... Uh, I had the opportunity to interact with a lot of international students at that time through where I was working and um, just had started to grow in a, in, a, in a passion for wanting to see people from other cultures come to know uh, Jesus. I met my, my wife at a Christian camp, Sky Ranch, up in East Texas, and she had always had a passion for missions and, and wanting to work in, in other cultures. So this is my wife, uh, Tiffany, and our children, Nasarian, Selah. Ezra and Magdalena. They're not with me this morning. We're trying to be a little bit careful because we're hoping to, to fly out in about a month. And uh, we have to have negative COVID tests to, to be able to get on the plane. If, if any of us show up positive, we can't fly. So I'm um, trying to be a little bit careful. So they're not with me this morning. Um, but it's a joy to be with you this morning, to be able to share a little bit about what uh, the Lord has us doing overseas and uh, to encourage you to say, say thank you. We appreciate that you're a partnering church uh, with us. Together we can work uh, so that the Lord um, can make himself known and strengthen the church around the world. Uh, so as Chris was saying, we had been in, in Ecuador. We, we originally started in missions in Rwanda in East Africa, but had some medical things that came up and we needed to look for a place with a higher level of medical care. And um, uh, through talking with our organization and prayer, the Lord led us to Ecuador. And we've served in Latin America for the last five years. Helping, I've, I've been working in helping to train and equip pastors and rural church leaders so that churches in rural areas uh, will be strengthened with a solid biblical and theological foundation, the foundation of Jesus in their, in their churches. This year, though, um, we've, we've started... Uh, talking about and praying about and looking into uh, the possibility of returning to Rwanda. And uh, some of those doors have opened back up. Our, uh, the team with our organization in Rwanda has invited us to return there, to be part of their team, uh, where I can continue helping to train and equip 
rural pastors and church leaders with a solid biblical and theological foundation. And so we believe that the Lord is opening the doors for that, and we're following Him in this. And we, we got back in um, August. We're hoping to leave in about a, a month to make this transition uh, to go back. So as you can see up there, Rwanda is a, a small landlocked country in Central East Africa. It is... Um, it's about the size of, if, if you think about the shape of Texas and the border out there in West Texas where Big Bend is, there's a little kind of notch in Texas. If you draw a straight line from Brownsville to El Paso, there's two counties right there where Big Bend is. That's uh, Presidio and Brewster counties. And uh, the size of those two counties is about the size of this country of Rwanda. It's a small country, uh, but a big difference between those two places is that in Brewster and Presidio counties, the population density is about one to one and a half people per square mile. In Rwanda, it's about 1,200 people per square mile. The most densely populated country in, in uh, Africa. And you can go ahead and go to that next slide. It's a beautiful country. It's called the land of a thousand hills. That's how it's referred to. And you can just see hills upon hills upon hills that are fertile, uh, much of the, of the population of Rwanda is based in agriculture. And uh, this, this is a picture of a tea plantation there. Lots of tea and, and coffee. You can keep going. These next ones. People there are um, beautiful and friendly, welcoming uh, people. You can keep showing some of the guys there working on, on building a building at our ministry center. And some women. Uh, you can see the fabrics that they wear. Um, just a beautiful, friendly people. It's a beautiful country. This lake uh, off on the, the western side of the country um, where they, they get a lot of uh, fish, freshwater sardines out of this lake. It provides a lot of protein for people in the country. Here's some, um, yeah, can, can you build a loop to throw around those, those horns right there? Some Ancole cattle. In Rwanda, that are, are a prized, cattle are a prized thing in Rwanda. Uh, wildlife. So you have this uh, beautiful country, beautiful people, but, but some of you, many of you might remember that uh, it has a hard history as well. So in 1994, there was a genocide in Rwanda, uh, 20, 25, 26 years ago now, and uh, 10% of the population were killed. So the population was about 10 million at that time, and as somewhere between 800,000 and a million people were killed in this genocide. And um, one, of the, one of the things we have to ask ourselves as, as believers in looking at, at that event that happened is, is that at that time, you would have had uh, 80, 85% of the population that would have said that they're Christian. About half of those Catholic, half of those Protestant, Christian of some form. 80 to 85 percent would have said that they're Christian, and a million people were killed in a genocide. I hope you, I hope you feel the tension there. That there's, a, there's a disconnect there. Those two things shouldn't go together, right? So we ask the question, why is that? What contributed to that? And the answer is complex. There's a lot, lots of things that went into that happening. But one of the things that, from a Christian perspective, Christian filter, we would say, is that uh, many of the churches there weren't teaching the gospel to their people. They, 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 they had influences from traditional religious beliefs in the country. They had influences from works-based teaching that's teaching that we can earn our salvation, and we can't. There, there was influence from... Um, from teachers that would say, if you just believe, then God's going to make you rich, and God's going to make you healthy, and God's going to give you good relationships in all of your life, right? And that's false. That is not the gospel. Uh, and so you had many churches where people were, were going to churches, uh, but they weren't being given the true biblical gospel. There was not a solid gospel foundation in, in many of these churches, and so um, one of the things the ministry that, that I'm going to be joining does is it provides a three-year training for these rural pastors and church leaders where they come uh, for, for two weeks at a time. They'll take a couple of classes and then they'll go back to their people in their churches and they'll be able to teach those things. 
Um, and they do that over a period of three years. And throughout that time, they, they uh, go through various classes, beginning with what is the true gospel, and then talking about uh, how to study the Bible, and, and talking about uh, children's ministry, and, and various aspects of, of how to help have a healthier uh, church. Uh, one, of, one, of the, one of the sad and very good things about this ministry at the same time is that on average, half of these pastors that come to this training come to faith in the biblical gospel for the first time themselves. So, so you have pastors that are already pastoring churches, teaching hundreds and, and perhaps thousands of people within a class of, of pastors, uh, and half of them had not believed the biblical gospel when they, when they started. Uh, so this, this isn't, sadly, this isn't something that is necessarily new in, uh, when you have Christian culture. Y'all understand the idea of the Bible Belt here in the U.S., where you have a lot of people that say they're Christian. I grew up in a church. I would have said I was a Christian because I grew up in church my whole life, right? But that doesn't mean you believe the gospel. That doesn't mean you trust in Jesus and what he's done for you through, your, through his death and resurrection, right? And that happens in churches as well as in individual lives. Um, and so that's a, that's a sad thing that these pastors haven't known the true gospel, the biblical gospel, and haven't been teaching it. But that's a good thing also, right? That God is equipping these men to now uh, have life in, in the gospel and be able to share that. Can you imagine a pastor who hasn't believed the gospel and who's been teaching some type of moralism in his churches comes back and, and, and tells his church, I've been teaching you wrongly. I've been teaching you false things. Uh, we're not saved by what we do or the bad things that we avoid doing. We're saved by Jesus and Jesus alone. You can imagine the, the type of life and transformation that brings to, to people in their congregations. And so I'm going to be, uh, Lord willing, by his grace, working with, with these pastors and church leaders so that these churches will be strengthened. Uh, my wife hopes to work with women and children in the area that we're living to uh, uh, do evangelism and discipleship in those areas. And we appreciate you being uh, a, a part of this with us. Um, so uh, we appreciate your prayers as we get ready to head out in, a, in about a month, make all this, all this travel during this uh, um, COVID restriction time. Is, is, uh, there, there are some challenges with that. Um, but, you know, more so prayers that uh, we would walk with Jesus daily. That's our biggest prayer request um, because God uses us out of, uh, you know, Jesus said it this way. Um, I'm the vine and you are the branches. Um, you, you, you can do, well, I'm losing the verse in my mind, but you can, uh, you can do uh, nothing apart from me. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of paraphrase, paraphrasing that right there. But you can do nothing apart from me unless you remain in, in the vine. So the uh, biggest prayer request is that we remain in Jesus and walk with him daily. Uh, but prayer request that we find the right ministry relationships there and and. Are, uh, involved with the, the right type of um, uh, people so that the gospel can be furthered in, in Rwanda. Um, we're going to be in the book of Hebrews this morning. Hebrews chapter 11, if you have your Bible, I invite you to open up to there. Yeah, here was the verse I was, I was trying to think of is uh, John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So um, we want to live and minister out of the fullness of walking with Jesus. So Hebrews 11, we're going to be talking about uh, how God's people endure by faith. How do God's people endure by faith? And specifically in Hebrews 11, if you've read Hebrews 11 before, um, it's sometimes called the hall of faith. It's this, these examples of Old Testament saints that we look at. And in this context, it's how, how do they teach us what it means to endure by faith, to live by faith? 
We're going to be reading from verses 13 through 16. We we pray with me before we begin this morning. Jesus, we thank you that your word tells us that you sustain all things by the word of your power. We thank you that your word tells us that it is only through relationship with you, abiding in you, that we can do anything. That we are not sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from ourselves, uh, but our sufficiency as ministers of a new covenant uh, comes from you. So we thank you that you use us in our weakness, that your strength may be displayed. And I pray that you will do that this morning. As we open up your word, as we look into your word, uh, would you speak through your word um, to bring life, to bring growth, uh, to bring correction where we need it. For your glory and for our good and the good of this church, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, For he has prepared for them a city. So just a a, a bit of context here. The the author of Hebrews is writing to Christians who are are facing suffering and persecution for their faith in Jesus. And there's a temptation on their part to say, should we abandon our faith in Jesus so we don't have to have such a hard life? So we don't have to endure these persecutions and these sufferings. Should we revert back to Judaism so we can, we can be like the Jews who are not being persecuted right now? Should we turn away from the faith or hide, perhaps hide our faith so we don't have to endure these difficulties? And the author of Hebrews is writing to them to say, no, endure by faith in Jesus because Jesus is better. Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than the Mosaic system. Jesus is better than the the Levitical priesthood of the Old Testament. Jesus is everything. He is better. So hold fast to Him. Endure by faith in Him. Now, I'm not sure that in Wilson County today that people are being tempted to abandon their faith in Jesus because of persecution. Uh, the type of persecution that, that happened uh, with these Christians in the letter to Hebrews, or that happens with uh, Christians in other places in the world where Christianity maybe is outlawed or persecuted more heavily. I, I'm not sure that we're facing that, but there might be temptations for Christians in Wilson County to think, I'm going to be a little bit more quiet about holding to Jesus so that I don't endure the scorn of these these people. If they know that I'm a Christian, they might make fun of me. Or if, if these people know that I'm a Christian, they might say things about me that I don't like. There might be a temptation to, to hide the fact that we are Christians. Or to say, you know what, I, I, I'm a Christian, but I, I also, also want to enjoy some things in, in this life that I know I shouldn't, but I'm going to try to live on both sides of the fence. And the author of, of Hebrews would be writing to say, no, if you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to follow him all the way because he is better. He is worth following. He's going to summarize all this in, in chapter 12 by saying, um, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith. Follow Jesus wholeheartedly. But how do we do that? In chapter 11, he's going he's gonna to tell us uh, some ways. He's going to show us how we can look at this example of God's people in the Old Testament to have encouragement to endure by faith. So, 
First question, what should your faith in Jesus cause you to recognize about your life on this earth? Well, the answer is on the screen right now. So you should recognize that this is uh, not your home. You have a homeland and this isn't it. Hebrews eleven thirteen. These all died in faith. Well, one of the things when, when we're teaching uh, pastors and church leaders uh, overseas, we, when we're talking about Bible study, one of the things we do is, is simply say, uh, we've got to ask questions about the text, right? We, we've got to ask who, what, when, where, why, so we can learn more about what God is trying to say to us. So when it says these all died in faith, well, who are these? Who are the these that the author of Hebrews is, is talking about? And right above that, you see he mentions a number of people. He mentions uh, Abel and uh, Enoch and uh, Noah. Uh, he mentions Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob. But in verse 13, he says, these all died in faith. Well, when we ask who, uh, it seems like it's referring to Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob because we know that Enoch uh, didn't die. Uh, it, it says at the beginning of, of Hebrews, we believe by faith that God took him. Right? So it seems like it's focusing in on this story of Abraham and his descendants when it's summarizing in this portion in, in verses 13 through 16. These all died in faith. So what does it mean that they died in faith? Well, they, can, they, they di died continuing to believe that God is faithful to his word. That, that God's going to bring about what he has promised. So are, are you enduring by faith and believing that God is going to uh, bring about what he has promised uh, in this life? And one of the things that involves is recognizing we don't receive everything in this life. Some of those promises remain future, right? So that verse continues, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. So what were the things that, um, that Abraham was promised? You tell me. What was Abraham promised? What's that? A son, right? He was promised descendants as many as the sand on the seashore. So Abraham lived to get to see his, his son born, although even this passage in Hebrews tells us he was an old man by the time he had a son, but he didn't see descendants as many as the sand on the, on the seashore, right? He got to see the beginning of that promise being fulfilled, but he didn't see the complete fulfillment of that promise, right? What else was he promised? Right, that through his, his descendants, all the families on the earth, all the nations on the earth would be blessed through, through his seed, right? The New Testament tells us that is through Jesus. Jesus came from the line of Abraham, and through Jesus, all the nations on the earth, families on the earth, can be blessed in him. Right, what else? Land, you all remember he was promised land? Uh, now, it, it, it tells us just above this that uh, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the, the story of Abraham, Abraham was living in, in um, Ur of the Chaldeans. And then he went to live in Haran. And God called him and told him to go to the place I am going to, to show you. He was a pagan. He was, he was not a, 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 one of God's people when he was living over here, God called him as a pagan, brought him to know himself, and then called him to go uh, to the land that he would show him. So he and his wife and his family, his, his nephew, you might remember, went with them to, to go to the promised land, the land of Canaan. And they, they went there, and this, this text in Hebrews tells us they lived in tents in the promised land. This was the land that God had promised them. They got to, to see part of God fulfilling his promise, but they didn't see the complete fulfillment of all of those promises that, that God had made, right? Uh, so how did their faith in the Lord cause them to view earthly reception of promises? They saw them and greeted them from afar, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles 
on the earth. The, uh, one commentator, George Guthrie, says, The promises of God must be embraced even though their fulfillment lies in the future. Life must be lived in our challenging terrestrial cities in light of a better heavenly country that will be experienced in the future. So, uh, the, one of the things that this points us to is this idea of expectations. And uh, you might know that sometimes the Christian life can be painted in such a way as, as to where it seems like if you just become a Christian, then everything is going to be uh, roses afterwards, right? Every, everything's going to be easy. All your relationships are, are going to be easy because God's going to make them easy. You're not going to have any financial problems and, and, and you're not going to have any health problems if some teachers will, will say that. But that's not true, right? Jesus said, in this world, you will have what? Troubles. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Right? Paul told Timothy, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Right? Not perfect relationships. You're going to be persecuted. Right? Not a life free from troubles, but you're going to have troubles in this life. But take heart, because Jesus has overcome the world. And we're to, to follow him, even though um, he had to walk through uh, scorn of, of, of people. He says he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We're to follow him in that. But when we are sharing the gospel with people, uh, we, we should be careful to tell them, look, embracing Jesus doesn't mean that you're not going to have any troubles in this life, right? God will help us with our troubles, right? We do get, to, we do get a foretaste of these promises that, that, that Jesus, through his death, has accomplished. We, we can have love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. We can have good things, and he helps us by the Spirit to endure and, and uh, uh, to walk through these challenging relationships and to walk through um, uh, difficult job, la uh, job losses or, or job transitions. He helps us when we get a difficult diagnosis, but it doesn't mean he eliminates the diagnosis always in our life. Sometimes he can, right? Can God heal us miraculously from whatever? Absolutely. Does he always do it? No. Some healings uh, await the fulfillment in the future. They, they await a future kingdom, a, a future country. Uh, and, and our faith in Jesus should, should cause us to recognize uh, that we are strangers and exiles here on earth. And that means we don't always have everything here on earth uh, that people that are simply of earth will have, right? So that can create a tension in us. You, you too sang a song where this is part of their lyrics. I believe in the kingdom come. Then all the colors will bleed into one, bleed into one. But yes, I'm still running. You broke the bonds and you loosed the chains, carried the cross of my shame, of my shame. You know I believe it, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. So uh, I'm not exactly sure what you two was referring to there, what, what Bono was referring to with those lyrics, but perhaps he was pointing to this tension that believers feel in this life. Uh, I, I think I would, I would say we have found what we're looking for, and it is Jesus, right? But sometimes this life doesn't feel like what I expected it might look like. There are hard things that come in life. There are hard diagnoses. There are hard relationships. There are uh, uh, challenges uh, that can, can lead us to a little bit of disillusionment if our expectations are that everything is going to be easy in this life, right? Um, e even even a, a, another song helps kind of um, uh, fill out this tension for us. This song, Is He Worthy? by Andrew Peterson. Uh, it calls us to recognize the tension that we feel in this life as people who live as strangers and exiles here. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. 
Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Uh, We don't get everything in this life. That's part of this whole message of Hebrews. Hebrews 11.1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We continue to trust God, even though we don't get the complete fulfillment of all of those promises right now. It's what's called um, the already, not yet, part of God's kingdom. God has begun to establish His kingdom, but it awaits a future consummation. It awaits the future where He's going to bring it into fruition completely. And we should long for that future kingdom as we pass through this life as strangers and exiles. So what will recognizing that this is not your ultimate home, that that you're a stranger and exile, what will it reveal about you? The second point is that it will reveal, you pull up that next slide, it will reveal that you long for a better country. You have a homeland and it isn't here. So acknowledging that you're a stranger on earth reveals that you desire a better country. Uh, Verse 14 says, For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. What what is thus? If we ask questions about this text again, what is the thus? People who speak thus. Well, he's referring to them saying that they were strangers and exiles. What is that saying about them? What is it saying about you if you say, I acknowledge that I'm a stranger and an exile on this this earth, right? Uh, here in Wilson County, you might, you might have a, 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 a good life. You might have your, uh, your ranch, your piece of dirt here. Uh, but I hope as a believer, you feel the tension that this isn't everything that there is, right? That this isn't everything I was made for, that there's something better that, that's coming, that that God is preparing, that, that Jesus is preparing for me, right? Uh, um, so this, this applies to both sides of this, right? Whether you have everything, I want to encourage you, this is not where life is found, right? Uh, just because you get a, a, a bigger truck, a bigger house, a bigger boat, uh, a, a new job, that's not going to automatically make life everything because that's not where life is ultimately found ultimately life is found in jesus there might be some of you that are struggling here this morning right you feel like i'm going through these difficulties in my life i've got these hard things going on and you know life just doesn't feel like what i expected it to feel like uh this message is for you also because uh we recognize as strangers and exiles on this earth that this life is, is never going to fulfill us. We were made for a different kingdom. We're strangers and exiles here. And so uh, it goes on to say, uh, these people are seeking a, a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. So uh, think of Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob. Uh, they go from Ur and Haran to the, the promised land. And the author of Hebrews is saying, if their ultimate home uh, was in Ur, where they came from, it was the culture that they knew. It was their people. It was their relatives. It, it, was, um, it was the land that they connected with, right? If that had been their ultimate home, uh, they could have gone back. But the author of Hebrews is saying, from this example we have in Abraham, They didn't see that as their ultimate home. They recognized that they were strangers and exiles, so they believed that there was a different homeland for them. It wasn't the place that they came from. Here's the interesting thing. It wasn't the place that they were going to either. The promised land wasn't the ultimate home of Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob. And you might say, wait, I thought the, the promised land, that's like, that, that's the good land, right? That's flowing with milk and honey type land. 
Yeah, it is. It's the land that God promised them. But it's not ultimate. It's a, it's a temporary beginning to the promises that God is going to eventually fulfill for his people. So uh, another commentator, F.F. F. Bruce, says, The earthly Canaan and the earthly Jerusalem were but temporary object lessons pointing to the saints' everlasting rest, the well-founded city of God. Those who put their trust in God receive a full reward. And that reward must belong not to this transient world order, but to the enduring order which participates in the life of God. Verse 16, but as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. They're longing for a better country. They're walking through the promised land, and they're longing for their ultimate home, the ultimate land, the ultimate country, not simply what is temporary here. So I was listening to the radio um, uh, a few weeks back, and I heard um, the commentators on the, on the radio talking about this uh, uh, show, The Real Housewives of such and such place. And I haven't seen the show, but I have kind of this idea in my, in my mind of what the show might be like. And uh, this lady mentioned on there, we, we like this show. I guess she was to speak, trying to uh, speak for women, but she was saying, we like this show because we long for that lifestyle. We long for that type of life. I hope you don't long for that type of life. I hope the life that you long for is the life with the Lord. The eternal life that he is, he is preparing. I hope that is the longing of your heart. And you acknowledge, if I believe in Jesus, he has adopted me as his child. I belong to him. I am part of his family, and he is preparing a place. I get to enjoy some of the fruits of that now, right? You, you have your brothers and sisters in Christ here in this church right now, and that's part of what we get to enjoy as believers. We get to enjoy uh, the, the Holy Spirit in our lives that brings us uh, uh, peace and uh, comfort that helps us, right? But we await the fullness of that in the future. So... Uh, the book, the, the Pilgrim's Progress, illustrates this really well. So um, for those of you who don't know, Pilgrim's Progress is a book about someone who becomes a Christian and he's living his life on this journey. It's an allegory. Uh, and, he, and he's going from the city of destruction to the celestial city. And he stops along the way at the house of the interpreter who shows him these doors of scenes that will help him in his Christian life. And one of them that he stops at is, is the story of passion and patience. And he says this, I saw moreover in my dream that the interpreter took him by the hand and had him into a little room where sat two little children, each one in his chair. The name of the elder was passion and the name of the other patience. Passion seemed to be much discontented, but patience was very quiet. Then Christian asked, what is the reason for the discontent of passion? The interpreter answered, the governor of them would have him stay for his best things till the beginning of next year, but he will have it all now. But patience is willing to wait. Then I saw that one came to passion and brought him a bag of treasure and poured it down at his feet, the which he took up and rejoiced therein, and withal laughed patience to scorn. But I beheld but a little while, and he had lavished all away and had nothing left him but rags. Then said Christian to the interpreter, Expound this matter more fully to me. So he said, These two lads are figures, passion of the men of this world, and patience of the men of that which is to come. For as here thou seest, passion will have all now this year. That is to say, in this world, so are the men of this world. They must have all their good things now. They cannot stay till next year. That is, until the next world for their portion of good. That proverb, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, is of more authority with them than are all the divine testimonies of the good of the world to come. But as thou sawest that he had quickly lavished all away and had presently left him nothing but rags, so will it be with all such men at the end of the world. Then said Christian, Now I see that patience has the best wisdom, and that upon many accounts. First, because he stays for the best things. Second, and also, because he will have the glory of his when the other has nothing but rags. The interpreter responds, Nay, you may add another to wit. The glory of the next world will never wear out. 
but these are suddenly gone. So do you long for that heavenly homeland? Do you have that hope that God is preparing a place for you in the future? Or is your hope confined to this life here and now? In 1 Timothy, Paul says it this way to, to Timothy. He says, Tell those who are rich in this world not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us uh, with things to, to enjoy um, and be uh, ready, uh, be generous and willing to share so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. All right, so uh, this isn't a message to say you... You can't have things in this life. You shouldn't have things in this life like a house and a car or uh, if you want a boat or, or, or whatever. This is, it's, it has to do with an attitude of our heart. Where do we find our treasure? Is your treasure in Jesus? Or is your treasure in the things of this world? Is your only hope the uncertainty of riches? Is your only hope that I've got to get what I can get right now? Because there's nothing else that's coming. No. This word of God tells us that God is preparing a city. He is preparing a better place. If we have this longing for this place that Jesus is preparing, we can sing with Henry Light, My rest is in heaven. My rest is not here. Then why should I tremble when trials are near? Be hushed, my sad spirit, the worst that can come, but shortens my journey and hastens me home. It is not for me to be seeking my bliss, nor building my hopes in a region like this. I look for a city that hands have not piled. I pant for a country by sin undefiled. Right, so so, uh, what does this look like to to long for that country in our everyday lives? I know it. It's, it's a big idea, and we can say, uh, yes and amen, we want to long for that city, but, but what does it look like in our, in our daily life? And I, and I think of a, a, a few examples. One is, uh, in, in 1 John, he tells us, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then he defines world for us, which is, is, is helpful for us. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. I think you can see in there that, that it has to do with an attitude of, of the heart, right? It's not, not wrong to have a house here, uh, but our hope is not, is not found on if we just get the perfect house, then we'll have everything together. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That's where our hope is found. Maybe it means uh, not clicking on that link on the the computer that you know you shouldn't uh, click on, but instead saying, I long for for God's kingdom, and so I don't want to be chained to the desires of, of this world that God is opposed to. Uh, maybe it has to do with how you see your relationships with other people. And, and you don't see them as simply what I can get out of this relationship or uh, what I need to do to, how do I need to manipulate this relationship to get what I want? But we can see our relationships as pushing other people towards Jesus. So in that book, The Pilgrim's Progress, much of it is talking about Christian's journey towards the celestial city by himself. But Occasionally, it highlights the people that come alongside of him in that journey. And that's the way I think that we should see our Christian lives is that uh, we have people that we can come alongside of and point, help, help them point their eyes towards Jesus. Right? I think marriage is a good example of this. As spouses, we should be pointing each other towards our hope in Jesus and, and the fact that, that uh, he is sufficient for all of our, our need, Right? So how should we respond to knowing we have a heavenly home? If we recognize that we're strangers and exiles, and that shows a longing for this better country, how do we respond knowing that we have a heavenly home? You should rejoice that God is preparing a place for you. You have a homeland, and God is getting it ready. Verse 16, 
But as it is, they desire a better country, a country better than the promised land even. That is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. So what is this idea of God is not ashamed to be called their God? Well, you get all through the Old Testament this reference to the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's known as, as their God. And why is he not ashamed to be called their God? Is it because they're perfect? Is it because they never sinned? Is it, is it because they, they got it right every time? No, right? It's because there are people who died in faith. They died continuing to trust the Lord. So, uh, um, what defines you, if you are a Christian this morning, is not whether you slipped up, whether you sinned, whether you failed, uh, whether, whether you, you, you think you got it right or you didn't get it right. What defines you is Jesus and the acceptance you have with the Father through Him. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have, that's declared righteous before God by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is who defines us if you're a Christian this morning. God is not ashamed to be called uh, the God of those who, who have faith in him. Uh, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob were people of faith, saints that help uh, help us know what it means to endure by faith. Andrew Peterson's song, Is He Worthy, continues, Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. God is preparing a city. John 14 uh, Jesus says it this way in John 14. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. In Revelation 21, it tells us a little bit about that place. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. A good place. Uh, the far green country under a swift so sunrise, as, as J.R.R. Tolkien would have said. Uh, a, a place without tears and a place without uh, sin. And not just the, the sin of other people that, that we uh, feel have hurt us and may have hurt us in our life. It will be free from that as well. But it's a place that's, uh, uh, in which we are free from our own sin as well. Right, scripture says, when he comes, talking about Jesus, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Uh, God will bring us glorified bodies and we'll be freed from the presence of sin in our lives. It will be a good place. Uh, we should long for that place and we should recognize that we are, if we are believers, we are citizens of, of that place before citizens here on earth. Uh, that is our homeland more than the country we live in here. That city is where we're going to uh, be more than the temporary residence that we have here, and we should uh, long for it. Why should that make you rejoice? Primarily because you don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. Right, Ephesians tells us it is by grace that you are saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. 
not by works, so that no one should boast. It is a gift of God's grace that we trust in Christ and his death and resurrection to bring the forgiveness of our sins. It is by God's grace that he went to prepare a place for us. It is, it is by his grace that we will get there one day. We don't deserve it. That's why it's so good that he, is, he has made us part of his family and we will get to enjoy that one day. But that should transform our life now, right? That should transform our desires. We should be content with the life that God gives us. We should seek to make wise financial decisions and all of that. But we should be content with what God gives us, knowing that we have a better place coming. We have a better country coming. Palmer, Palmer Hartzell uh, wrote a song that um, captures this well. He says, I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one. He is the just one. He has the words of life. I am resolved in who will go with me. Come, friends, without delay, taught by the Bible, led by the Spirit, will walk the heavenly way. How do you endure by faith? How do you lay aside those weights and sin which clings so closely and run with endurance the race set before you? Well, one of those ways is by recognizing that you're a stranger in exile on this earth, by revealing that you long for a, a better country, and by rejoicing that God is preparing a place for you. You may be here this morning and you, that doesn't connect with you. Uh, you don't have that hope because you've never trusted that Jesus died for your sin and rose again. I hope, I pray that you will do that this morning. That you will believe the gospel message. You might have grown up in church, uh, told people you're a Christian, just like me your whole life. Uh, but there's, uh, that doesn't mean that you have truly believed the gospel and uh, have peace with God through him. Um, scripture says that being declared righteous by faith, all we do is believe uh, what Jesus did. We believe in him and his work, that he died for our sins to pay the penalty, the punishment for our sins, and that he rose again. God says, if we believe that, we will be saved. If we believe that, we will have peace with him. If we believe that, we will belong to his family, and he is preparing a better place for us. If you're a believer this morning, but have been struggling with uh, uh, the allure of the things of the world, uh, Jesus said it, it this way in, in, in Luke. Uh, watch yourselves, let your, lest your, your hearts be weighed down by dissipation and drunkenness and the cares of this life and that day come upon you like a trap. Uh, the things of this world can weigh us down sometimes, right? We need to be reminded that we have a better place coming. And we don't have to think that we have to get it all now. We can live our lives delighting in our true treasure, which is Jesus. I hope you will uh, take that message and uh, chew on it this week as you go throughout your week, being reminded that you have a better place if you are a believer. If you are an unbeliever this morning, if you have not believed the gospel message, I'm sure there will be a, a pastor's and church leaders up here afterwards, you can find them to talk to them about what it means to trust the gospel. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you that you have made us your children, uh, allowed us to be your children through faith in the person and work of your Son. Thank you for your grace that saves us. 
Thank you that through him we are made a new creations and we are made citizens of a new country. Thank you, Lord, that you are preparing that place. Thank you, Jesus, that you left to go prepare that place for us. Thank you that our ultimate hope is found in you, Lord, and not in this world. Will you help us, Lord, to treasure you above all else, to love you with our whole being? For your glory and for our good, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.